Good evening and welcome to this live virtual town hall with your state lawmakers, Senator Annette Cleveland, Representative Sharon Wiley, and Representative Monica Stonier. My name is Andy. I'm going to be your off-camera moderator for this evening. The 2021 legislative just wrapped up on time a few weeks ago, and tonight is your opportunity to ask your state lawmakers uh, any questions you have about the bills that the lawmakers passed and the other issues that they discussed. Uh, we sent out a survey monkey uh, questionnaire earlier this week and got a lot of questions from folks in the 49th legislative district uh, also got other questions via email uh, and other sources uh, we are also live tonight on multiple different streaming platforms uh, so if you have any questions throughout the evening you're more than welcome to submit them in the comments section of youtube or facebook and we will answer those as well um, so tonight is all about asking your questions and giving you a recap of the legislative session uh, I will turn it over now to Senator Annette Cleveland for some opening remarks. Thank you and good evening, everybody. We're so pleased to be here with you and thank you for joining us. Uh, I am always honored to be a part of this very strong 49th Legislative District team. Uh, the three of us, of course, representing you in the legislature in Olympia. And I'm Senator Annette Cleveland and um, looking forward to uh, your questions tonight and a discussion of the 2021 legislative session. And I'll begin by just uh, sharing a, a, a brief um, summary, uh, if if you will, um, but first want to make certain that my seatmates have an opportunity to also introduce themselves. So, um, Sharon. It's great to be here. Um, it'd be better to be in person, uh, but this is almost as good and we're pretty used to it by now. I'm Sharon Wiley. Um, I've been the uh, one of the representatives here since 2011. I serve on the Finance Committee. I'm vice chair of the Transportation Committee, and I'm also uh, back on the Commerce and Gaming Committee. Um, this was a very uh, momentous uh, session, and we'll have a lot to say about it, and I'm hoping to um, really hear from a lot of people tonight. Um, I um, am very proud of the work that we did. Uh, we had fewer issues to deal with because it was so hard uh, to get our work done virtually, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without our incredible staff who really stepped up um, as they are tonight and uh, made it made it feel um, very effective. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, but now I think we'll hear from Monica. Thanks, um, Sharon. Monica Stonier, um, proud to serve the 49th Legislative District with my seatmates here. I uh, I'm on the Education Committee in the House. I'm on the House Appropriations Committee and also serve on the House Health Care Committee and am proud to um, serve my caucus as the majority floor leader. Um, I would say that, yes, this uh, remote session was quite challenging, but Washington was very successful in having a um, transmission free and very safe session this year so that we could do the work of the people. And again, appreciate the credit that we give to staff for making that happen. Uh, looking forward to questions tonight and looking forward to a live town hall in the future. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Uh, and um, I'll briefly share that I currently serve as chair of the Senate Health Care Committee. I also sit on the Senate Transportation Committee, as well as the Rules Committee. And new this year, I also joined the Senate Housing and Local Government Committee. So looking forward to talking more about the work of those committees, as well as um, take your questions on other issues that um, the legislature considered this year. As you well know, we entered the legislative session in January facing some very urgent and emergent issues. We were uh, in the midst of the continued pandemic. Uh, we had um, faced pretty devastating wildfires as we can all remember from last fall. Uh, there were so many who um, still were struggling to obtain unemployment uh, because they'd potentially lost their jobs uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, um, that against the backdrop drop of racial injustice, of um, an insurrection in our nation's capital just prior to the legislative session beginning. So we had um, 
great many um, urgent emergent issues to address. And I'm really proud of the fact that as a legislature, we um, prioritized and we were able to um, make tremendous progress on continued COVID response, on climate action, on police reform, on childcare and early learning, on um, housing and, and a more just economy. Um, and I'll, I'll share really briefly that coming into session, myself and my colleagues uh, in the Senate, uh, in the Democratic caucus, committed that we were going to view um, every issue through uh, an, an equity lens and not just the policy issues that we were considering, but the budget as well. And um, I'm really pleased that we very much adhered to that um, commitment. We also um, discussed uh, that rather than try to strive to uh, get back to the status quo, uh, in the state as we were facing all these um, big challenges, um, we were committed to making changes that were going to build a stronger state for everyone. And um, so I think that um, we were very successful in um, being strategic and focused on those um, priorities. So um, happy to um, talk more about uh, what we worked on um, or the 49th Legislative District or take any other um, questions that you might have. So um, looking forward to good discussion. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you for that recap and for those introductions. Uh, again, folks, if you're just now tuning in, this is a live virtual uh, town hall with your lawmakers, uh, Senator Cleveland, Representative Wiley, and Representative Stonier. Uh, so if you have a question for your lawmakers tonight, just go ahead and put that in the chat box below. and. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can within the next hour or so. Um, first question we have uh, came in from Survey Monkey via Curtis, who wanted to know um, what the legislature and what the three of you um, were doing this year to help with the homelessness crisis. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start, but I hope uh, my seatmates will chime in as well. Uh, we continue to make um, tremendous investments in um, um, housing and, and homelessness. And I think the three biggest um, policies that we worked on this past year and passed was Senate Bill 5160, which uh, protected tenants and better supported um, landlords. It um, created the first in the nation um, statewide right to counsel, um, ensuring that, that low-income tenants would have access to free court-appointed attorneys um, when facing any um, legal issues around um, their housing. We passed House Bill 1236, which has been um, years in the making, and um, it is just cause evictions. It requires landlords to provide a, a good cause for evicting a tenant. And then House Bill 1277, which was also aimed at eviction prevention and housing stability and um, helped to fund housing services and eviction uh, prevention services. Um, as we know, the pandemic um, forced so many uh, into really difficult situations. And um, the last thing that anybody should have to face uh, is um, concern and fear of losing uh, their home. Uh, I was going to identify those three bills as well, Senator Cleveland. So um, those were, are definitely, I think, bills that were very impactful for those that are struggling with uh, housing security. And, you know, I'm just recalling the debate on the House floor around many of these and uh, these discussions. And I'm very appreciative of those of you who uh, ensured that stories of people struggling and who needed the passage of these policies um, were in our inboxes that have called our offices. I know that at one point in time, I called home to um, get some details on a specific story that I knew needed to be told um, from Southwest Washington because there was some criticism that these solutions and that the challenge was really Seattle-centric. 
And actually, uh, we know that this has been a crisis in Southwest Washington for a long time. So um, in addition to the three bills Senator Cleveland mentioned, uh, our budgets also uh, co continue to invest more money in the um, programs that we had in the past to ensure that um, tenants and uh, landlords had some financial security as we recover from the pandemic. So um, there were policies passed, but also we continued to invest in those um, those programs that we know helped keep keep people housed and help keep landlords paid. Um, I'd like to add that over the over the last um, ten years, I've seen a lot more um, support and understanding of the many causes of homelessness. And um, there wasn't one thing uh, because there isn't just one problem to address. And uh, protecting people in the current crisis. Uh, was urgent, and we used some of the, you know, a lot of the federal dollars that came came to us to address that. We tried to um, boost the existing funds, like the housing trust fund that goes out to communities um, and is is flexible. Um, and we also, um, every year that we go into session, we loosen up the um, the rules so that communities have a little more flexibility to really target the needs in their community um, uh, and fixing something this big, particularly with the pandemic is a real challenge. Um, I think that it's progress that more people understand that it's not simple. Um, and I think there's a huge commitment to keep, keep moving forward and not just um, say that we, we threw a patch and we addressed the emergency uh, and now we're done. We're not done. Um, along with what we have done for regular people who are who are housing challenged because of the crisis, uh, we are in the process of really building out our community-based mental health systems. 40, 50 years ago, um, this, the federal government started walking away from subsidized housing and, and providing federal dollars to help us with housing needs. At the same time, uh, we we started realizing that our, our state institutions nationally uh, were hell holes. Um, and we rightly tried to back away from that, but we didn't step up. No state stepped up and provided the community-based mental health system. We are in the process of really doing cutting edge things to make sure that not only do we address the housing issues, but we, we do the kind of mental health and physical health system approach that we should have done 40 years ago when we started shutting down those bad institutions uh, so that people can um, can get well, they can get stable, and they can be part of their community. So all of that is a work in progress. Stay tuned because we're going to keep working on this. That is a great segue to our next question uh, from Joe, who submitted a question on Facebook. Um, you just did a great answer of his first part of his question about what the legislature has done. but. Um, Joe's asking what is going to be on deck possibly for next year and the, and the years to come uh, specifically to address the rise in housing costs. I'll take a little shot at that. Um, there is, that's a big question. Um, one of the things that ha is, is happening um, that is a little bit different that I think um, shows some uh, hope, people some people have blamed uh, land use uh, regulations and environmental regulations um, for um, the price of housing. Um, it's not that simple, but to the degree that um, that flexibility for locals to have uh, more ADUs, accessory dwelling units, um, the t tiny house movement, all of that plays into our land use laws. And this is a year that there was a lot of coming together of both uh, Republicans and Democrats to say, what can we do to update our land use laws to make sure that there is the type of housing that meets the needs of every person um, and does it in an affordable way. So there's a lot more, um, uh, there was a lot more work this year at trying to do that, at trying to make, provide more flexibility, better use of land, that if we're going to have land use laws, let's make them work and make sure that they aren't contributing 
unduly to to the price of housing. Um, but I think the big the big question is how do we deal with income equity? You know, how do we create good paying jobs for everybody? And what do we do about this unprecedented time in our society where the gap between the highest pay and the entry level pay um, for jobs that used to be able to support a family is so great uh, that people can't afford to eat, live and take care of their kids. I'll only reinforce um, Sharon's comments by saying, you know, specifically, we have addressed uh, some of the policy issues, but really it's a matter of implementation at the local level. So we will stay in touch with our local folks to keep an eye on inventory and make sure that the inventory in the housing market in Southwest Washington is not um, at the very top end where people don't have access to um, investment in, ho in home ownership. And then again, um, as we discussed all throughout the legislative session, really looking at the equity in the access to those financial tools and to the wealth that opens the door to home ownership to our um, community. And so um, while we can um, pass policy, uh, it's really the implementation and the work at the community level that we will have to keep ongoing in order to um, really make movement here. So I appreciate your question and particularly um, the highlighting of the fact that um, we need to continue to do all we can to, to better support and incentivize home ownership. So families do have the ability to build some equity and have the opportunity to build some wealth. And um, um, I think that's gonna take all of us um, looking at um, various ways to, to go about that. Uh, we There has been an effort in the legislature. We did pass um, a bill recently to um, try to make it less challenging to build condominiums because oftentimes that um, the, those housing units that uh, are available for purchase can be um, more affordable, but there were some barriers to our state laws that um, prevented the development of uh, or, or, or condominiums um, being built. So, um, you know, I think we're just gonna have to look at the um, full complement of um, um, how we can make um, all, uh, uh, manner of various different um, housing options available to people. All right. So the next question we have uh, came in earlier this week from Lizzie, who wants to know if the COVID-19 vaccine will be mandatory uh, when shopping in stores this year. <clears throat> We're getting this question a lot. Um, and, you know, at this point in time, the vaccine um, is limited in whether or not it can be mandated, particularly for us at the legislative level. But in independent businesses um, have the right to determine what policy they want to adopt in order to keep their constituent, their customers and their workers safe. Um, I know that there has been a bit of pushback on Either, either any policy that seems to come forward. And so uh, what we really need uh, to do is just remember that the pandemic is not over, that the vaccine is important for um, the safety of the community at large, and that um, the businesses that um, choose to put a policy in place that they feel works best for keeping their business safe um, um, would appreciate not only our patronage, but also our support in their decisions there. And Lizzie, that's um, an excellent question. And um, yeah, I know from the state um, perspective and from uh, my work with the Senate Healthcare Committee, the focus has really been on um, providing information and education around the vaccine and ensuring that we're meeting people where they are um, in their communities to um, answer questions and ensuring that their providers, um, those who are trusted um, um, within that their circles, um, have the information um, to share as well and um, recognize that uh, it is uh, the decision of each individual and each individual family um, in regard to vaccines. Excellent, thank you for that. Again, folks, this is a live virtual uh, town hall. If you've got a question, go ahead and submit that in the uh, uh, comment section of your uh, platform there and we'll get to as many as we can tonight. Uh, next, we have a question from Tony, uh, healthcare question. 
uh, what are you doing? I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because his question was a little longer, but uh, what are you doing to support a uh, public option healthcare system in Washington state? Uh, and what can proponents do to fight back against efforts uh, by the health insurance industry uh, who are trying to stop um, public option policies? Thank you for the question, Tony. And um, I'm proud to say that our state is was the first in the nation to pass public option uh, health care coverage. And that is offered through our state's health benefit exchange. And um, this year, we built on that uh, foundation to also begin to stand up um, health care coverage premium subsidies so that those who are um, just unable to purchase health care insurance because they can't afford it will have some additional support and help um, so that they are able to buy coverage for themselves and their family. So um, we have been hard at work here in our state um, ensuring that we're putting those um, choices in place for uh, individuals. Um, I'll also mention that we did that in collaboration with some of our health insurers. Uh, not all of them were supportive of a public option, but there were those that were. And um, I'm a firm believer as a policymaker in ensuring that everyone is at the table and everyone has a voice and that everyone's voice is heard. And um, I think that in that way, um, we are able to um, hopefully uh, pass the strongest policy possible, um, but also have the needed support um, to implement the policy. And to answer the um, what I what I remember of the second part of the question, which was, you know, what can folks do to uh, keep that moving forward? I think the more we hear as lawmakers um, here in the 49th, but across the state. So if you have friends and family that live in other districts, I'd encourage you to encourage them to do the same. Um, it, it's always helpful when we hear from you what a difference it would make for your access to health care. And um, it keeps us thinking about the, the problems that need to be solved. It keeps us motivated uh, to keep moving in the right direction uh, to bring the, the high cost of care um, down and to increase access for everybody in Washington. So um, to keep in touch with us and to keep us posted on um, your preferences and what it would mean for your family, I think is um, also really important. All right, and sticking with the uh, the healthcare theme here, we had a question submitted earlier this week from Gail. Wanted to thank you for supporting telehealth and Cascade Care subsidies. Uh, she says, we are looking forward to broadband build out and continued work to control prescription drug costs. Uh, we hope that remains a focus of the state and federal cooperation. And I want, and I, I know it's early, uh, but what bills which failed in the healthcare arena do you see coming back in 2022? Gail, uh, thank you for that question. That, that There's a lot of information in your question. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, there is obviously no shortage of um, issues for us to continue working on in the healthcare space. Um, but the, to answer your question directly, the bills that um, were introduced this year mm -hmm. that didn't move forward that I'm sure will uh, continue to be discussed and that we will um, hopefully continue to work on next year um, would be first and foremost um, the role of dental therapists in our state. That's been an issue. It's been around for quite a while. And um, currently, um, we don't have that uh, provider designation in the state of Washington. Um, other states do, like Alaska. Um, and so uh, I would expect we'll continue to talk about that. Um, a bill did not pass this year that was put forward around removing barriers and challenges to accessing um, death with dignity. Um, and so I think that that'll be continued to be discussed. Um, and we're gonna continue to, to discuss telemedicine and um, the need to continue to update our laws and statutes, given that telemedicine has been so critical, particularly in this um, pandemic, to um, providing um, care uh, when you can't always uh, see your provider face to face. So. Uh, those, those are just a few that come to mind. 
All right, thank you for that question. Uh, we are gonna switch gears here a little bit, uh, figuratively, and go to a transportation question. Uh, we have uh, a question here submitted earlier this week. Um, what would a transportation revenue package have done in terms of a new I-5 bridge uh, and what happens without that revenue package? I'll take that one um, since I'm vice chair of transportation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, leading up to the session, um, uh, I and a small team um, met with 81, um, 101 stakeholders in 81 meetings between the end of session and, and Thanksgiving uh, to talk about what should be in a transportation package and how should we pay for it and what are the priorities um, of each community. And we talked to everybody from the environmental community to the disabled community, to the people who haul the asphalt, um, airplanes, uh, boats, uh, trains and cars and buses. Um, so we came in uh, with a really strong package. It was different than the package that had been developed on the Senate side and that the governor had developed. And we worked um, very, very hard um, to do the budget that would adjust to the changes and the uh, loss of revenue that we had. All of our projects were on pause before the session because of the initiative. And when that was overturned by the court, then that meant that we could deal with that budget and modify it. But we had um, probably um, a, a much greater loss in the transportation budget than the operating budget had. The, the um, buying things by mail and paying sales tax on them uh, kept part of our budget a little less bad off than the transportation budget where we lost gas tax. Uh, we lost um, tolls. We lost ferry fares. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of adjusting to do. Um, several years ago, or a couple of years ago, we did fund um, the preliminary work to get the bridge back uh, on track. And that work is proceeding. We're working well with the Oregon folks. Um, the package that we proposed had um, upwards of a billion dollars in both the Senate and the House budget. There was a little bit of difference there. Um, the package hasn't passed just yet, but we're still working on it and trying to come to an agreement that we can live with um, and, and, and be ready uh, when there is federal dollars to match it. And we're, you know, in best case scenario, uh, that package would be ready um, and the feds would act sometime in September so we'd know what we had to respond to and what we could partner with in order to meet our transportation needs for the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, so all of that is a work in progress. Most transportation packages don't get done the first year that they're proposed. Um, and we're, we've got the funding to continue to work on the bridge um, so that when we're, when we're done, when we're ready, um, that those federal and state dollars will be there because we will have, we will have worked out the details. Uh, so we, um, we did what, what uh, both the House and the Senate did. We looked at the past, current, and future inequities in our transportation pro uh, programs. Um, this is a year where we were dealing with uh, carbon from cars. We've dealt with it every other place, but the big place where we haven't done enough is the carbon that's produced from our transportation system. So it became more complicated, um, but we're still working really hard. The work doesn't stop just because we didn't get something done in one session. Um, and I, I'm going to just quickly add, you know, in the meantime, um, as Sharon mentioned, um, we have our bi-state legislative action committee for the I-5 bridge replacement um, that's active and um, moving forward the work uh, of um, the project. And we have our project office uh, that Greg Johnson uh, leads. And that um, is funded by um, uh, an appropriation that we all worked to secure um, goodness, I've lost track. I think it was two years ago now. Um, and so uh, the work of the project um, does continue and all of the important community conversations that have to go on around that are taking place. Um, so I'm sure you, you'll hear, you're hearing about that and you'll hear more about that as that work continues. 
All right. Next, we have an education-related question. Uh, this one is for uh, Representative Stonier, but certainly if the other lawmakers want to chime in as well. Um, what are lawmakers doing about education and getting kids back into the classroom this fall? Well, while we were in session, uh, we were sure to pass along the federal um, financial support that came to the state, thanks to the federal government uh, and the leadership there, uh, straight to schools so that we could um, ensure that schools were well-funded for the now myriad of delivery uh, of education um, strategies that are in place. Um, so I know that while, you know, we were in session and we wanted to make sure that funding went through, we also took a look at some of the policy shifts that we needed to make. Um, we've uncovered um, some challenges that we knew existed in the past with regard to funding, but we also have learned a great deal about what students have been left out of the communication in school in general. And so um, from a lawmaker's standpoint, I know that we are going to continue to work with and monitor through the district level um, and, and the building levels. And of course, hearing from families is really important as well, uh, how that um, return to school and how the recovery from this past year is going. Um, in my day job, working for Evergreen Schools, I'm spending a lot of time right now working with teachers who are trying to identify students who would benefit from some support over the summer, some extended hours, and districts are working to figure out exactly how they can deliver that additional support for students between you know, today and when we go back to school um, in the fall again. Uh, I know that um, anybody working in schools knows that the behavioral health needs of students that have been out of school, not only feeling isolated, but also um, dealing with the anxiety and depression that comes from either that, uh, that isolation or just concern about what is going on in their communities, or in many cases, um, kids who are at home who in, in unstable um, house, housing uh, situations, uh, unmet um, food needs, uh, all of this is going to uh, need to be addressed when we see students back in school. And um, I know we're really working on the social emotional support that students need when they come so that they can be ready to learn academically. And um, I am encouraging families and uh, educators to remember that kids need to feel connected to their school um, and that helps them to learn. And so if you're doing anything to help keep your students connected over the summertime, um, the fall will go much smoother. Uh, we know that it is the expectation of OSPI, our um, agency here, uh, to make sure that as many kids as possible have access to in-person school. And um, it has been shown through the data that I have seen from Dep Department of Health uh, reports that the transmissions in schools is incredibly low. Um, I have observed that it's because students are doing a good job of following the distancing and the masking rules that we have in place. And many schools um, can identify if there is a positive test or uh, a positive um, uh, case of COVID-19, they're able to isolate those students and the group of students that they've been with uh, and have those students kind of um, re removed from for a couple of weeks until that uh, incubation time passes. Um, and that really keeps the numbers low. We are struggling to do that in the broader community, but schools have been incredibly successful, which means we feel comfortable getting students back to school. Um, the only thing I would mention is the challenge with having our staff uh, vaccinated and prepared and safe at school. And that is going much better than it did a couple of months ago. Um, so I know um, that I know schools and, and educators are doing their best to prepare for the return of students, as many students as possible in the fall, mine included. All right, next we are gonna go to a question um, about our tech structure. Uh, this one was directed from uh, uh, from Mike, uh, sent to Senator Cleveland, but feel free to uh, other lawmakers uh, chime in as well. Um, <laughs> Senator Cleveland, why do you believe the majority of Republicans were right and the majority of Democrats were wrong on the capital gains tax bill? Thank you for the question, Mike. And um, my concern around the capital gains tax uh, was not the concern uh, that I heard the Republican express. Um, my concern around the capital gains tax when we considered it uh, first uh, early on in the Senate was that I felt strongly that the first uh, uh, revenue 
uh, vote that we should be considering in the legislature um, should be uh, the one that would have the greatest return on investment. And that, in my mind, was investing in our transportation infrastructure. And um, my concern was that uh, uh, we would not um, uh, take that vote in moving forward to transportation revenue package if we um, had already approved uh, other new forms of, of revenue. That said, I have always strongly believed that we must address our state's very regressive and unfair tax system, the most regressive in the country. And so while I'm disappointed that we didn't pass a transportation revenue package this year, I'm very pleased to have cast my final vote in support of the capital gains tax. And in fact, um, the second time it came back to the Senate felt um, much more comfortable with the fact that um, the um, revenue was directed to um, support for child care. And that is something that does have a very high return on investment and something that I uh, very much could support. And that's why I cast my vote in favor of capital gains uh, tax at the end of the All right, thank you for that. Um, next, we have a, I believe it's a Facebook comment that came in from Jim. Um, thank you for, um, and sorry, Representative Stoner, that's <laughs> covering you up a little bit there. Um, thank you from Friends of Vancouver Lake with your great work on helping uh, Vancouver Lake. Uh, we couldn't do it without your united support. Uh, next step is a good hydrology study. Um, state agencies own both water and the lake bed. So how do you think we can persuade them to help Great question, Jim, and thank you for it. And um, really um, happy to have been able to be successful with my uh, two seatmates in um, ensuring that there was funding in the state operating budget that we passed this year to um, help address the health of Vancouver Lake, which is such a tremendous asset to our community. And um, uh, feel that um, that was the first step of providing some funding so that then we could bring stakeholders together and begin talking about next steps and the work of uh, ultimately putting together a strategic lake management plan so we can ensure that we're better protect protecting that resource, um, not just um, today, but um, for the future. And I would um, just say that the work that you all have done uh, at Friends of Vancouver Lake um, has really helped educate me about the long range economic benefit to the region, uh, the livability, the recreation, um, and the sheer joy of living in Southwest Washington that will be enhanced as we move forward with uh, the development of Vancouver Lake uh, into the vision that we, I think we all share. Um, but one thing we can do is help the agencies uh, see that vision. And I think you've got three partners here uh, that are committed to doing that. Uh, and I think that with that, by broadening that shared vision, uh, we will continue to make progress. And I think we can persuade them to be helpful. I think that all of us have to um, keep stepping up um, and making sure that all of our elected officials know how important this is to the community. Um, and I, um, we've, we've worked with our city, our county, our court, uh, on many things over the years. And um, this is something that um, they maybe didn't expect uh, to be working on right now, um, but there's there's jobs, um, there's water quality, um, there's a lot there. And um, when elected officials know how important it is uh, to their people, uh, they will step up and having that money um, available. And thank you, teammate. Um, is going to make it a lot easier um, because we, we need a long-term solution. And um, because the lake is um, ha has multiple government jurisdictions uh, with, with some ownership and some responsibility and a lot of unclarity, um, it's going to take a real strong public effort to put together an entity who's 
solely responsible for making sure that that asset is there for our children and grandchildren. All right, thank you for that question, Jim. Uh, next, we have a question that came in from William, uh, who's watching us on our YouTube channels, wants to know um, why are the, uh, uh, where are the increasing costs in healthcare economics coming from? William, that's a complicated question, but I appreciate it very much. Um, there are so many different factors. I think that um, obviously the technology um, and cost of technology and keeping up with the technology is very expensive. Uh, um, that's always evolving. Um, the rising cost of prescription drugs um, it adds a tremendous amount of cost to our current healthcare system. Um, and I think, um, the fact that we our current healthcare system still continues to focus on sick care, on urgent and emergent care, and um, we have to continue uh, keeping our shoulders to the wheel and making that tremendous shift from a system of sick care to a system of wellness and and prevention. And that's why we put so much focus in the state toward um, access to primary care and making sure that uh, there's access to coverage. And, and no one should be without health care coverage. And while we've made strides here in the state in um, expanding access to health care coverage, there are still those in the state who don't have any health care. And um, uh, we established this past legislative session, in fact, a universal health care commission. And that commission is going to take up the work of universal health care task force that we established a couple of years ago that made recommendations to us. One of the recommendations was the, to establish this commission to continue the work of um, laying the foundation for universal health care, ensuring that every single individual um, has health care. Uh, and that healthcare uh, is a right in this. Uh, I would, oh, sorry, I would I'll just, yeah, thanks, Andy. I will just um, also share that the passage of a drug transparency bill from the past session um, helps us know what to do. And Senator Cleveland's work on that um, was, um, you know, incredibly important for the passage of the bill and. Um, as we see the results from what we will uncover um, from some of the very protected parts of the, um, the financial chain of the healthcare system, we will know what to do next, uh, what we will attack next to help bring the cost of healthcare down. And so some of the solution is on its way. So, all right, thank you for that. Um, next, uh, we have a question about uh, climate change uh, that was submitted earlier this week. Uh, we are in a climate crisis, but I'm worried we won't be able to reverse course before it's too late. Did the legislature pass any bills that would help? Uh, yes, uh, the legislature did. And um, we are now ranked um, the the highest, the best, and the strongest in environmental policy after the bills that we passed this past session when it comes to um, work done at the state level. Um, Washington has uh, been leading on some of these issues for a long time, and so I'm not at all surprised. Uh, this year we passed the low carbon fuel standard um, and we uh, passed a cap and invest bill that takes the biggest pollutants in our state and rethinks the approach um, to, to really reverse the clock. Um, you know, there's there are a number of other um, policies as well, and many of them are actually hidden in some of the other bills uh, that may not go through the environment committee, they might go through the local government committee, um, but it is definitely uh, continue, it, it will continue to be a top priority for us um, in the legislature to continue making progress there. I agree that we are in a crisis. I also feel incredibly accountable to the generations that are coming up and holding us accountable and for the generations that will follow that we do uh, good work um, without delay on this as um, the next uh, legislative session approaches as well. All right. And our next question um, was another big topic the legislature dealt with this year, um, submitted earlier this week. Uh, what did the legislature do this year on uh, police accountability and reform? 
uh, and also what work still needs to be done um, in the coming years. Yeah, we uh, made great progress, I believe, in um, a short amount of time. There's met, there's much work that is left undone that will continue, but we took up this um, issue of police accountability very seriously this session. We made progress where we could find agreement and solutions that made sense, and the longer conversations will be ready for us when we return to the next legislative session. We were able to pass a bill that um, outlaws or that prohibits the use of uh, no-knock warrants and chokeholds and much of what uh, has been the discussion of some of the, in a, in a police tactics bill, much of what has been the discussion of um, unsafe practices um, when not used properly and um, when used disproportionately on um, particularly our black and brown community members. Um, so I think we made uh, considerable pro progress there. Um, we also, you know, in, when we passed I-940 in the, in the, um, in the past, uh, there were some discussions that were started but not finished, and many of those continued this legislative session uh, to result in, I believe, better policy and accountability. We're also moving toward independent investigations and prosecutions so that any um, police officers who are involved in um, excessive use of force or for and fatalities as a result of that will not be investigated by um, those involved in that particular community. And uh, we're working to stand up a state um, effort so that we have specialized um, a legal team and accountability team there, uh, but also uh, so that communities um, that do find themselves in, a, in that type of investigation can be assured that it is um, investigated independently of those who were involved. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of, of the good work that we were able to do. And in fact, uh, we, we have a lot of law enforcement um, and former law enforcement people uh, in the legislature. And I think that really helped to inform the policy so that uh, we were sure that not only was it going to be better and safer for our community members, but also um, with thought to how law enforcement can evolve and um, should evolve. Monica did such a good job of summarizing uh, all the work that we did around police accountability. And uh, we passed no, no fewer than 12 different new bills um, focused on this and a, a tremendous amount of our um, time and, um, and energy um, was put toward this because it's so critical, it's so important because we recognize that um, it, you know, in communities around the state, trust uh, has been broken and, um, and people's lives have been shattered as a result. We have to, um, we have to work to better ensure that um, we're building safe and, and healthy communities and um, that our citizens can feel um, um, that, that there's um, trust. Um, so uh, I was going to also mention that um, we do have continued work um, to do in this area. And I'm really proud particularly of the fact that um, again, as I said at the um, outset, um, we kept our um, focus and looked through the lens of equity and equality um, for every policy that we um, passed this session, but particularly the police accountability and police reform bills that we passed. All right, going back to the um, topic of vaccinations again, um, a question that was uh, received earlier this week. Uh, I'm relieved to see progress on getting control of the pandemic, but it seems like vaccination rates are unusually low for Clark County uh, compared to the rest of the state. Uh, what can be done to change people's attitudes uh, and acquire the herd immunity we need so we can be safe and safely reopen? Well, again, you know, this is a question we're getting often. In fact, I'm looking at Senator Cleveland on my screen here because I know we uh, have been in a couple of meetings recently where this question has has come. And um, one of the one of the things that I've learned a great deal about is the power of information and education when it comes to um, talking with community members who are hesitant or need more information from a trusted source about the safety of getting the vaccine and what it would mean. And then there are a lot of people who are just hesitant because they don't like getting shots. And when they realize that um, that is um, 
And in fact, this is one of the reasons why the one shot Johnson, the the J and J version that was just one shot was so um, highly requested because you'd only had to go get it one time. And so for people that just are squeamish about getting shots, you know, reminding them um, the safety that it provides and uh, the health um, protection um, to the community, uh, it goes a long way. And so um, I've noticed that there's a lot of PR out there right now, people doing neighbor to neighbor conversations. I know that um, church leaders are answering questions that folks have about the vaccine and that when public health and um, community leaders and neighborhood leaders have an opportunity to answer questions um, with the facts, uh, people increase their likelihood of getting the vaccine. And so that's a little bit more groundwork and um, it takes a little bit more time, but I am just really pleased to see that now um, children who I know have been waiting to feel safe before returning to sports or school um, have access, access to the vaccine. I know that my kids couldn't wait um, to have that protection. They're about four days away from safely hugging grandma and grandpa, so they're looking forward to that. And um, that students that are, are anxious to return safely to school and know they have the protection of the vaccine alleviates their mental health concerns uh, a great deal as well. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that that is, is um, now, now available. So we'll see a spike in access now that children have access to it. But um, again, we're gonna come back to that tapered off level um, when, it, when we hit that hesitancy <laughs> and that education requirement. Um, but I'm sure Senator Cleveland and Representative Wiley may have more to add. Well, I think that uh, the more people sh that share that they had the shot, it didn't hurt, and no, and the side effects were worth it, if they if they were any side effects at all. Um, I think that we just need to talk to each other and listen to each other. Um, it'll be, it'll. I think we'll get to a point where where there will be a tipping point where it'll seem kind of silly. Um, to not go, not to not have the shot, and peer pressure, um, as long as it's respectful, uh, is a good thing. And I'll just um, share that vaccine vaccine distribution has been uh, one of the things that I've spent the majority of my time um, working on in tandem with our Department of Health and the Governor's Office um, over the course of, of the last uh, five six months, and. Um, you've probably noticed that, um, as Monica said, there's now been a shift away from those max va uh, vaccination um, sites, mass vaccination sites, um, to vaccines available more through provider offices and um, through local um, community clinics um, so that uh, people, uh, patients can talk directly with um, those healthcare providers that they have relationship with and, and that they trust um, to get their questions answered and make sure that they feel um, that the, the vaccine is safe. Um, I know for me, when my daughter um, received her second vac dose of the vaccine, um, she looked at me and said, mom, I didn't, I didn't realize um, that uh, this would give me such hope, such hope for uh, for the future and for um, our, our world, hopefully um, returning to uh, some uh, semblance of, of normalcy. So um, I certainly um, can attest to the vaccine being um, safe and effective and hope that all of us can embrace that hope uh, for the future and do everything in our power to encourage others to uh, get vaccinated as well. All right, uh, next question um, is a topic that was in the news recently. Uh, internet connectivity has been a problem uh, in many communities, especially uh, during the pandemic. Uh, can lawmakers help get broadband out to more homes? I'd love to uh, start with that. I know we all have a concern um, and the pandemic really uh, made urgent something that we actually have been talking about for about 10 years. Um, and, and um, there were a number of things done. We passed a bill um, that will allow utilities, uh, local utility districts to, um, to offer uh, broadband. Not all will, um, but um, that barrier has been, has been there for a long time and now it's gone. Um, I have a bill 
um, that I'm very proud of that will, uh, we're gonna be doing a whole lot of transportation projects. Um, the fish culverts that were mandated to uh, replace um, all over the state are going to be an opportunity to incorporate broadband conduit uh, into our infrastructure for the future. And um, we, uh, we're we going to be doing that and removing the barriers and the federal government is working in tandem with us to make sure uh, that we can do that and that we think about it early enough in the project that it doesn't add costs. And so um, that, uh, that bill uh, was, was focused on transportation, but there were efforts in a lot of different arenas um, to try to make sure that not only does everybody have broadband, but we have good broadband, sufficient broadband for jobs, for education, uh, for public health. Uh, and uh, I think that, that uh, you know, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is it raised the level of urgency told us what we need to do. And by golly, we, we took some big steps. There was a misconception that this was um, more uh, prevalent a problem in rural areas. And what we know, and many people who live in urban areas already knew, uh, that it really is about the speed and quality of that access. It's not just about whether or not you're wired. Um, and especially given how much healthcare, how much education, and how much business, uh, small business work has been done uh, from home across um, on the web, on the phone. Uh, it has been uh, clear to us that uh, we have investment to do um, so that this infrastructure as it ought to be seen um, is uh, the way we've viewed it in Washington for a while. And now we are in a position to make good progress on that after the investments this year that we made in broadband. And I think our policy actually sets the stage for many other states to be thinking about broadband access as a, a utility or as infrastructure that is absolutely necessary um, and, and not necessarily a commodity. All right, thank you for that uh, question. Um, we are just about out of time here, um, but one thing that's kind of unique that some people may not have known um, who are watching tonight or listening tonight, um, this was a uh, mostly remote legislative session um, given the pandemic and the other situation, situations going on. Um, so I just wanted to toss that out there real briefly for each of you, what your experience was like as, as chair, as a vice chair, as the floor leader in the house, what, what was your experience like uh, this session compared to others um, doing it mostly virtually like we are here? Well, I'll start because um, as the floor leader, I was quite lonely without all my colleagues around to visit with. Uh, there were only two or three people um, from each caucus allowed in the building and on the floor uh, during the legislative session. And normally uh, the halls are teeming with bustling um, constituents and the noise of lobbyists uh, working policy. And um, so it was it was quite lonely. And I was there, now this, the view of the Senate, of course, there's a few more people there. They have a little bit more real estate. They have uh, more um, square footage around each person and fewer members. And you can see I'm there on the floor with the other, with the Republican um, floor leader. And it was, it was challenging at times, but uh, I'm real proud of uh, the work that our staff did to make sure that we could have a session. And, um, you know, I think many of our members appreciated uh, if we were able to get done with our work in time, having dinner with their families because they were working remotely and voting remotely uh, because of the good work that our staff did. I was in town uh, every day that we had floor action. So that was about three days a week. Uh, unless it was um, cutoff time. And then I was there for two or three weeks um, straight uh, at those two windows of time. And, um, you know, I can I can just say when I'm there by myself, I really miss my, my colleagues, but I was glad that folks were uh, safe and that we were able to not only stay um, protected from risks of contracting COVID-19, but also mm -hmm. from the threats our state capital faced leading up to and after the um, insurrection of, of our nation's capital, a dark day that I know many of us um, were um, disappointed to see. And then we will continue to, to keep an eye on those threats so that we can make sure that the building is safe for us to work in and for the public 
uh, to participate in. I think one of the, as the vice chair, calling on people and, and keeping track of the people that were wanting to testify verbally or to weigh in, there were hundreds and hundreds of people that I don't think had ever testified before that were able to do that. And there were some rough edges and it was uncomfortable, um, but a lot more people participated, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the same. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the biggest things for me at home was that my husband couldn't believe how long <laughs> my meetings were and how many there were. Um, and I kept saying, well, honey, you know, um, this is what I do when I'm in Olympia, when you don't see me. Um, but uh, it was, uh, and keeping the cats off my lap was, was a struggle. <laughs> um, but I think the good news is that we got a lot more participation and I think we'll figure out ways to continue that so that not everybody has to drive to Olympia or hire a lobbyist in order to uh, have access in the heat of the session. Um, all of us are accessible outside of session. Um, but um, I still had my 15 minute meetings with constituents. Um, so either by phone or the way we are right now. And so um, we got we got used to it. Um, I think sitting that long and not being able to walk around uh, was was tough on the bodies, um, but we we survived. And I don't think there's any other legislature in the country where uh, staff and legislators didn't get sick. A lot of legislators le legislatures shut down for a bit because they had outbreaks. We did not, not one. I'll just um, add because I know we're um, getting close to conclusion tonight, but uh, leading up to session, staff did just a tremendous amount of work building and designing uh, uh, an online system that was workable. And uh, I will admit that um, all of us were expecting that uh, the session would be um, Oh, and um, that we would have to really temper our expectations around what we could accomplish virtually. And I am here to say we had but one of the most successful legislative sessions uh, in years, and we accomplished um, more than I think any of us could have um, imagined. And um, yes, as Sharon said, it was challenging to be tied to your computer screen 16 hours a day um, and literally uh, not have time sometimes to um, even grab food. Um, and it was sometimes was challenging to communicate with the people that you needed to, um, staff and, and, um, and your colleagues to uh, talk about the various policies that were being considered. But um, overall, it was largely just a tremendous um, success. And um, I doubt there'll ever be another session that I can um, spend uh, almost entirely in my sweatpants. <laughs> And on that note, uh, we are going to wrap up now. So thank you for that. Um, that is all the time we have for tonight. Uh, if we did not get to your question, which usually happens because we get a lot more questions than we have time for, um, in just a few moments, I'm going to throw up the contact information uh, for each of your lawmakers up on the screen. Uh, so please feel free to uh, contact your lawmakers there and they will be uh, able to get back to you after tonight's um, town hall. So thank you again all and I'll turn it over to the lawmakers if you want to give some brief closing remarks before we end. I'll, I'll start the closing remarks I guess. I am um, very proud to serve the 49th ninth Legislative District uh, in Southwest Washington at large on many issues. Um, we each uh, have some areas of expertise and we're well distributed in the 49th district. And I think um, that serves, again, not just the district, but the region well. And so I'm uh, proud of the work that we do together as a team. I'm thankful for the uh, feedback, the questions, the guidance, um, and criticism that we get in uh, our inboxes and phone calls uh, that come into the office. I think that keeps us well informed. And so I encourage folks to continue to do that. Um, I'm proud to have just concluded a session where we delivered on many of the priorities we set out to do, which is to work to recover uh, and to, uh, to, to end the pandemic, um, both uh, the economic uh, impacts and our health impacts. 
um, to do that work with a lens of equity. And that equity lens was used in every uh, bill committee and um, consideration for the floor for each of the bills that we looked at this session. And then to make progress on one of our biggest priorities, which is uh, to make um, a dent in the in the efforts that we need to be doing uh, to address climate change. So I think we did um, a bang up job, as Senator Cleveland mentioned a minute ago. Uh, those were the priorities we opened the session with, and we were hoping to just be able to finish session, but instead we're able to conclude with major progress in each of those areas and uh, work to reverse our regressive tax structure so that um, our, our estate is better served by the tax dollars we invest. So um, I'm just, again, proud of the session, uh, proud of our constituents and the input that we've received and proud to be a part of this team. So I thank you all. We're coming out of a period of great divisiveness in our country and, and in, to some degree in our communities. Um, our legislative body um, gets along a lot better than the federal legislative body does. Um, we had to work really hard to stay together and to work together um, and get things done. And we and we did it and it was gracious and it was heartfelt. Um, in my own community, people stepped up, you stepped up. And um, we need to keep doing this and build on it and, and mend the divisiveness that we've, we've all experienced and we've all seen and get at the root causes with the equity issues, uh, making sure that we, we build on the future and we build the kind of future and have the kind of vision that we want and do it together. Um, we had to work at it. Let's build on that work. And um, well said, um, both of you. And um, I do absolutely agree. We have to, to lead with um, respect and civility. And I am so very um, honored to serve with these two tremendous individuals, um, but also to represent this amazing district. And um, can't thank an you enough for staying in such close contact throughout session, um, sending your emails uh, and your feedback, your guidance, um, as we considered so many uh, very critical issues and policies this um, year. And I can't wait until we can all be together again. So get your vaccine and uh, let's end this pandemic and, uh, and keep looking um, ahead uh, to plan for the very best future that we can together.